nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So this is uh, lecture 32 on MOS electrostatics. MOS here is written as shorthand for metal oxide semiconductor and it could be a capacitor or it could be a transistor. The capacitor would be two terminal structure like a diode and or it could be a transistor. So in that case, it will be called MOSFET. And we'll discuss this very important device, which is at the heart of the microprocessors and all sorts of electronics today. I would probably say 90% uh, of the market today for electronics is essentially based on MOSFET. So that's a very important, uh, important new cl class of devices. We'll start with a brief background. You know, this is a very important topic and most than likely that when you go for any job or any, um, if you join any company or if you have to teach a class, let's say like this, then you certainly want to understand MOSFET uh, without understand it perfectly, so that would be good. Now, like any new device, we'll begin with band diagram. That's work number one, with and without bias. And then we'll talk about the capacitor aspect of it, the two terminal aspect of it. And it's very interesting the way the charge moves with voltage in a MOSFET, because MOSFET has an insulator, and I'm coming to that, that it has the oxide. Therefore, it is in some way, in details different from bipolar. Bipolar did not have a oxide in it inside the device. Oxide meaning insulated. So there was in MOSFET, uh, in bipolar, current was flowing through emitter, base, and collector. We had to balance the current. But in MOSFET, that's slightly different. So uh, I will then conclude. Now let me bring back that original picture that we had in perhaps the first or second lecture of the semester and you can see that we have covered a lot of things by now. I said that the 606 involves, uh, you know, quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics and transport equation. That was the first five weeks. Now you know, right? The effective masses, the band gaps, this various crystal orientation, so on and so forth. And we have talked about diodes and bipolar and in the last uh, three weeks, which will about be nine, nine lectures or so, uh, we'll talk about MOSFET and then the semester will end. I wanted to bring this back one more time to give you the historical perspective. Of course, the diode on the very left for the vacuum tubes, we haven't discussed that. That's really a device that went away, but in some modern form like a MEMS device, MEMS transistors, metal, uh, Metal, no, what, what is it? MEMS is microelectromechanical, microelectromechanical switches in some form. It is coming back again as a small thermionic emitter. So for, uh, so that diode, everything is dead, rises one more time, it appears. Now you understand that bipolar transistor, right? That was a short key barrier bipolar transistor. That's why it has a wage. That was the extra credit problem that you had for the homework. And finally, we'll be talking about this MOSFET. And the MOSFET, you can look that it looks like a very strange structure. First of all, there's a lots of line on the 1960s until now, that one. Uh, the lots of lines going in different ways, you can see. Hopefully, by the end of uh, next four lectures, uh, you will understand exactly why this device looks like the way it does and why this is sort of coming to an end. Even the scaling of a MOSFET is coming to an end very quickly. So uh, that's why that's the discussion we'll have. And the reason it's coming to an end very quickly is because these days you have how many? Maybe 30 million transistors that you can fit in the head of a pin. This uh, pin that you have, 
you can fit 30 million of them. So five pins is all you need to give every person in the United States a transistor. That's the five heads of pin and that's it. It's fantastic the degree of sophistication and integration that has been, been possible for, bipo, uh, for MOSFET. A key question is, why is it that we can do it for MOSFET and couldn't do it for bipolar? And the main thing that I'll ask you to see as I go through this lecture, that in MOSFET, when you turn the MOSFET off, the amount of leakage current is minuscule. So you can put them, a lot of them together and still on not have that much power dissipation. You couldn't do it with bipolar. Bipolar simply consumes too much power. And so this is something I haven't explained yet, but this is something you should look out for as I go through the lecture that why this statement could be true. Now a MOSFET looks like a lateral bipolar transistor. You remember that bipolar transistor is a vertical device. Emitter on the top, base in the bottom, uh, in the middle, and the collector on the bottom, right? And this was a double diffuse structure. Do you remember? We had a uniformly doped material, diffuse the base once, and then diffuse the emitter once. The current was coming down vertically and then laterally flowing through the subcollector and coming back up through the collector. Basically a vertical device. For a MOSFET, you will notice that this is a lateral device. The two green fingers that you see on the left hand figure, those two green fingers are let's say N-dope region. And the magenta that you see, is a p dope region. So you have essentially an NPN transistor. And if you contact it somehow, let's say the ash colored region in the middle, if you contact it directly, in some way it would look like a bipolar. One question you immediately ask yourself that if it is looks like a bipolar, couldn't it act like a bipolar? Meaning, why don't people simply go ahead and contact it on the top? And I think the answer you should recognize by now that that would be too far out. Emitter and collector would be too far out. If you put a base contact there, all the current will flow out through the base contact. Nothing will go to the collector. As a result, here you put a thin layer of insulator. That's more clearly shown on the right hand figure. More schematic, but more clearly shown. Here, the blue hatcheted region. That's the insulator. So in the bottom, this is all silicon, at least in the beginning, you know, N, N plus, P and N plus, these regions are all silicon, let's say, or germanium, one material, and the blue is silicon dioxide. And the N plus region you see vertically close to the gate, it could either be polysilicon or it could be a metal. So polysilicon historically for, I would say, uh, in the beginning it was metal. So uh, when the first Intel computer came out, this was uh, aluminum metal in 1970s. Then for a while, this was polysilicon for last, I would say, 30 years. Now the most modern or latest Intel computer that the Pentium that you have, this has once back gone back to metal this N plus region along the vertical side, you know, on top of the blue. And this is a picture I have shown you before. One thing again, you notice the silicon is crystalline because I want the electrons to go very fast. Silicon is crystalline, but silicon dioxide is not only an insulator, but you will notice that that is amorphous. The atoms are not is randomly oriented. It's again a very important point to remember or understand why this has to be more or less a amorphous material. It cannot be, so it has to be insulated of course, but at the same time it has to be amorphous. Because if you didn't have it amorphous, there's always possibility that one of the grain boundaries will be present in the oxide. And since it is supposed to stop current, even a single grain boundary can short your substrate to your gate and the MOSFET will be lost. And if you lose one MOSFET, that means you lose the whole IC, let's say. So in that case, this is, people generally prefer it to be a amorphous material. Okay. The symbols, 
well, symbols you may have seen this before. There are two types and the dominant one is transistors which are normally off, which is that N plus and the green region that you see is P and then N plus. So that in the off state, if I haven't done anything, then you realize there will be a barrier. There is a diode between N plus, yellow N plus region and green substrate. So there is a barrier and as a result, current doesn't flow unless you reduce the barrier somehow, forward bias the junction somehow. Current doesn't flow and the corresponding symbol is shown uh, on the right, uh, on the right. You can see that instead of having three terminals that we had in a bipolar, this device has four terminals and it's very important. Generally MOSFETs have four terminals. There are some subclass of devices have three terminals called SOI, silicon on insulator that has three terminals. But primarily all MOSFETs have, normal MOSFETs have four terminals and the fourth terminal termed here as B is the body contact. The fourth terminal that is sort of grounding the green region. You also have gate which is equivalent to the base. Uh, you have source equivalent to emitter and drain equivalent to collector. So you can see more or less very similar electrostatics, very similar flow, but that's something important to see. Another thing you will notice that this device is two dimensional. That is to say that if you look at the gate uh, through the oxide which is red, when you apply a potential, then that potential is perpendicular to the, to the device, whereas the current flows from source to drain. And so current is flowing perpendicular to the electric field from the gate. Of course, there is a uh, lateral electric field also from the drain, but you can see immediately it's a two dimensional device. As a result, although this is a simpler device actually, this is not something people teach earlier on, right? Earlier on in the, in the, in the course. There is also another type of device. Uh, these are normally on devices. So the green region instead of being P, uh, it's N. So typically the transistor will be on and you will have to shut it off by using a gate voltage. So change the potential barrier and thereby change the, and you can see the only difference between the two symbols is that the channel region has a little thicker line to indicate that this is a normally on transistor. Right? So just very quickly, let me show you how if you see a picture of a modern MOSFET, how you would interpret it. In this particular transistor, in this particular configuration, it looks like the transistor is lost in the crowd of columns. Like these are looks like all Greek columns, right? And these columns are essentially the interconnect lines. Interconnection is a very complicated thing. When you have a billion of transistors, 1 billion people and you have to connect them all. It is 10 layers of highways, 10 sort of 10 layers of highways that must connect all these transistors. It's a very complicated but at the same time beautiful process by which it's done. And you can see all those columns, these would be the drain contact. Do you see that little transistor sitting there in the bottom? That's the transistor and you have the drain contact, let's say, shown here. So there you can see there are two transistors sitting in the middle, right? You see that? If you blow up that region, you will see transistors these days looking something like this. It's a little tilted. You can see the green region is again the body of the transistor where the electrons would flow. And these days, most of the transistors are strained and I'll explain what it means. But it means that it's not standard silicon just, but it must be its lattice constants have been either elongated or compressed compared to normal silicon for which the electron would flow. Do you see the yellow polysilicon, polysilicon gate region, it's a gate contact and a very th thin and tiny uh, oxide region. These days oxides are on the order of let's say 10 angstrom or so, 10 or 12 angstrom. And this is the latest, uh, this is the latest in you can, where you can see that 
the source and drain has been replaced by silicon germanium. It's no longer silicon. So it's beginning to look like a HBT, isn't it? And HBT, is it a single heterojunction HBT or a double heterojunction HBT? Double heterojunction HBT. You can see silicon germanium to silicon. I have one heterojunction, silicon germanium to silicon, another heterojunction. So everything that you have learned so far, many of the things you could easily apply to this problem. You can see again the metal replacing the polysilicon and the oxide these days are being replaced by silicon dioxide is being replaced by some version of hafnium oxide. Now I am setting this all up because I want at the end of eight lectures that you be able to answer that why these have to be the way it is or at least why people have adopted this particular sequence. Why couldn't they stay with simple silicon all the way through? So the purpose of all this derivation and everything is to understand what people do and why they do it. Okay, so after coming back to earth, uh, let's talk about the basic band diagram one more time. So we are talking about MOS capacitor now, two terminal device. And the MOS capacitor is essentially a metal gate. You know, we, we are just not thinking about polysilicon yet. We'll think about that. And the red oxide, we'll assume for the time being silicon dioxide, amorphous, let's say. And a substrate, which is silicon. And then I have the body contact shown in the black on the bottom. I do not have in this particular device any source drain contact. That's why this is called a MOS capacitor, not a MOS transistor. Because here you can see I have just two terminals, as if I have two metal gate and the body contacts are like two metal plates, and in between I have like an insulator and the semiconductor. That's like the filler inside the inside the capacitor. So that's what we'll be going to think about. Okay. Now this would be the band diagram. Now band diagram do you I think by now you should be an expert in drawing band diagram hopefully but first of all you see that this is a heterostructure type band diagram and how does it come about well again you do draw the blue line first and you know this is a n type sub oh, sorry p type substrate the light blue region so you make sure that your fermi level is very close to the valence band of that of that material draw the conduction band correspondingly in the insulator you will have a uh, band gap right and then correspondingly you will have the insulator chi for the insulator you can see chi i correspondingly uh, chi for the semiconductor chi sub s and for the metal phi sub m the only thing that is very interesting here is because you do not have any doping in the insulator right so therefore do you see that whatever electric field you have the electric field is continuous. How do you know? Because the potential is linear. If I take a derivative of the potential, that gives me the electric field. So the electric field is a constant. And if I take another derivative of the electric field, then I get charge. And the charge is zero. So therefore, in the insulator, I do not have any band bending. Right? So it takes a little bit to draw it, but I hope you will be able to draw this, uh, draw this particular diagram. By the way, silicon dioxide has a band gap of 9 eV, about 9 eV. So it's a huge thing, silicon dioxide. You know how big 9 eV is? If you made the whole earth, whole earth made of silicon dioxide, which is almost what it is, I think it's like not 100%. Silicon dioxide comes from it's a, a sand, right? Sand is silicon dioxide. If you made the whole world with sand, there wouldn't be one electron there. Because with 9 EV, NC, NV, E to the power EG over KT, that's Ni squared. With 9 EV there, you do not have even a single electron in a volume of 10 to the power 27 centimeter cube. So it's a very good insulator. If, for example, let me start with, so we'll get back to that original diagram a little bit later. It is a little bit difficult to analyze. For our purposes, we will start with an idealized situation where 
I have chosen, I'll assume, chosen three hypothetical materials, three hypothetical materials in which the, so I put down an oxide, 9 EV gap, and then I essentially draw the same diagram, but hypothetically this one, I have chosen some three combination of metal, semiconductor, and insulator so that the vacuum level is flat. The idea is that we will understand this one and then any change that there is in actual material will just modify the understanding. But this is easier to understand. So this would be a, essentially a idealized MOS capacitor, right? In general, you realize that that's not what's going to happen. But let me assume that I have found some metal whose vacuum level exactly coincides in a horizontal fashion with that of silicon and then I have this particular particular combination. Okay, now let us think about this device. By the way, that is the rate, that is the capacitor, uh, that is the oxide region. How much charge do I have here? I do not have any band bending, right? You see, I do not have any band bending. So, what is my potential? Zero. I do not have any band bending, so my EC is flat, so and V is flat, but I could take that V to be my reference, right, and then make it flat also. So, although I shift it a little bit with respect to the X axis, this is actually 0, that is what I am trying to show you. If my V is 0, what is my electric field? 0, yeah. And what about the charge? 0. And you can see, that is true, right? Do you see that everywhere I have the whole region is essentially flat, Ni square is equal to Np and it must be charge neutral, no depletion, nothing in here, no depletion region. And as a result, I have in this system lots of charge but no excess charge. The net charge is zero but of course I have tons of electrons and tons of donors at every point. So, I am not saying that there are no charge, lots of charge, net charge is zero, okay. We should stop here, this is so simple that life may be actually simple for once. What is VBI? Finally, at least in one case VBI is zero. So, because you can see, you can go from one side of uh, phi sub m and another side, you have to add up this q phi sub s eg minus delta and then when you do that, you essentially get VBI is 0. You can see it is flat, so it should be there. Okay, so since I have solved my equilibrium problem so simply, let us think about the DC, DC characteristics, okay. Now, let us think about it slowly because this is a very important, these are important concepts. I am talking about the capacitor, two terminals. I have grounded the body, which is the P side. I have grounded and you can see with the, with the rhombus type uh, blue, blue region, that is a diamond shaped blue region through which a blue symbol, I have grounded it. So, at held, holding it at zero potential. And as a result, my corresponding uh, Fermi level remains flat. Now, on the other side, on the gate, what voltage do you think I have applied? I have applied a Fermi level has gone up and I have applied a negative bias. When I apply a negative bias, then the Fermi level moves up. Now, when the Fermi level moves up, then of course, in order to compensate, the whole bands must bend upward, right? Or just like a PN junction. When you apply a reverse bias, let us say, then does not the whole region inside also follow through? So, that the same thing happens. A very important thing here is to realize there is no current flow because insulator is 9 EV barrier. It is very difficult for the electrons to go through that region. You know, if you try to do thermionic emission, only the tail above that band gap, that, that tail of the electrons would be able to go. You do not have any electrons to begin with and so the tail will be minuscule and there will be no current. As a result, 
my Fermi level this time is really flat because remember previously it was approximately flat because the current was small but now the current is zero and the what is the expression for the current n mu gradient of the quasi Fermi level that's zero zero so in that case gradient of the quasi Fermi level is also zero that's the distinction from a diode or a bipolar okay now do you realize that if you bend the band then the holes yeah so okay just just for a second there uh, so there will be after bending the bands there will be a lot of accumulated holes do you realize that why there are more you can see the Fermi level has gotten closer to the conduction band after band bending and the smaller the separation is then larger is the number right so you have more holes close to the oxide on the semiconductor side and to balance it there will be more electrons now you realize on the metal side i should also have shown a little band bending but you also remember that if you have a metal semiconductor junction metal has so many electrons that we do generally do not show the band bending but essentially you'll, you might have a little bit and had it been polysilicon you could have quite a bit. So that is the situation and we will call this region accumulation self explanatory right you have accumulated the majority carriers and the holes are the majority carriers and you have accumulated more of them so that is called a accumulation region when that happens when you apply a voltage which essentially builds up the majority carriers so that will depend on whether the substrate is p type or n type in this case if you apply a negative bias then you have accumulation if you apply a positive bias on the gate then what would happen in this case now the electron will be pushed back in the substrate region do you see it bends such a way so that the Fermi level remains where it is remember there is no gradient and this is grounded so Fermi level is not going anywhere but when you bend the band then you can see close to the oxide semiconductor surface the band has moved away from the Fermi level as a result you have fewer free electrons so you have more exposed doping so you can see the red region I have shown here these are space charge immobile charges depleted charges right and you have correspondingly the positive charges on the metal side this region will be called a depletion region and finally you have if you keep bending it more and more in of course what would have happened in a in a uh, in a metal semiconductor junction a short key barrier huge amount of current would have started flowing right you have so much and there might have been impact ionization and other things right but because of the insulator we are lucky no current is flowing so you can put quite a bit of voltage until that one breaks down and that we will discuss later and in the process you will gradually see these green electrons building up very close to the surface now in contrast to the red region reds are positive right these are depleted acceptors right now sorry negative these are depleted acceptors green is also negative these are electrons but the green is mobile they can go where they want but the red are fixed accepted charges sitting in the space they cannot go anywhere they want right so this region when that happens when the mobile carriers essentially takes over then that region that high voltage will be called that inversion region why is it called inversion because the majority carriers were holes now close to the surface the majority have become electrons so the carrier type has been inverted as a result these would be called inversion charges and inversion region now in between when it goes from purely red and when the green one sort of comes over and takes over that is called a threshold voltage that at that point actually the inversion has occurred and we'll call that vt there's a little prime sitting there just to indicate that these are all idealized devices 
we'll have to correct it for real structures a little later. Do the same thing for had it been n type, n type substrate. You can do the whole thing. You can see the whole voltage axis simply will flip. Again, you will have accumulation, depletion, and inversion, and you, you get the idea. Now, where did those charges come from? Well, where does this force come from? They come from the body contact. You can see it's just a P region. And so these holes will come from there and accumulate over there. If you keep bending more, it will want more holes. It will keep coming from the keep coming from the body contact until the electrostatic requirements are satisfied. Now, what about this one? Now you have charges coming in here, N A. Where have the uh, holes gone from that region? Well, they have gone out. If you don't want the holes, they can easily flow out through the body contact and be done. Now the interesting thing is, where does electron come from? That's the problem. Holes can come from that one easily from, from the right, from the body contact. But you see, electrons, if they have to come, they will have to jump over this barrier, right? From come, trying to come from the contact and that's a, that's the problem. So why, where do they come from? They come from a hole goes out, an electron hole pair is generated by shock release hall or thermal generation process. Do you remember that this is a depleted region just like a reverse bias PN junction? Depleted region, so electrons are generated, and as a result, the green electron has been generated, a hole has been left behind, and the hole comes out through the body contact. You realize immediately that this will be a slow process. Because Shockley Reed Hall generation may be in the order of maybe 10 to the power minus 6 seconds or so, right? So, if you want it done very fast, well, it's not going very fast. If you want it a gigahertz or a uh, 100 megahertz transistor this way, you're not going to get it because the electron, the green electrons, will not be able to generate that fast to provide you the inversion electrons, right? So, this is the gating item. And of course, we'll integrate the charges to find potential. Once we have this, then actually we're in good shape. Now, before I get there, let me talk about this response time issue. Just what something that I just alluded to. When the holes in the inversion, re holes in the accumulation region is coming in and out, that's the majority carrier, right? What is the time constant with which majority carriers can come in and out? That's the dielectric response time. I told this several times, right? For MOSFETs, or I'm sorry, the diodes and bipolar, I have told you this several times that the holes don't themselves do not come. They just inform the neighbor, neighbors and the information is passed along. This would be very fast because your sigma is for the majority carriers is very large. As a result, if you put them in the time constant, it will be less than a picosecond with which the holes will come in and out. The effect of holes will get in and out very fast. So, depletion and accumulation happens very fast. On the other hand, if you want to generate those green electrons in the inversion region, you will have to generate them through shockley reed hall process. Do you realize why I have dropped the N and P? So actually reverse bias junction sort of, right? The whole region has been depleted. N and P are approximately equal to zero. In that case, you only have Ni squared in the numerator and another N on the denominator, you have this. So you, you remember this. And as a result, this is a slower process, okay? Now let's talk about charges. So how would the charge look like? This is how it's going to look like and I'm going to explain to you why it comes from. Q sub F is the amount of charge in the semiconductor. I'm not thinking about the metal now, just the semiconductor. If you put on the negative bias, negative bias is accumulation. Then you will see that the accumulation charge will go with phi sub S is the surface potential, explain in a second. 
and it will go exponentially with that. If on the other hand, if you apply a positive bias for the surface potential, then it will initially have a square root dependence that is up to the uh, depletion region and then you will have another exponential rise that is in the inversion region, the green, green electrons that is in the inversion region. So, let me explain where they come from. So, we will have to solve these equations. Do I have to solve the electron and hole continuity equation? Not really. I have insulated, no currents are flowing. So, at least I am set that I do not have to follow, solve them. Only thing I have to solve is a Poisson equation and then I will be done. So, let us solve Poisson equation. Now, that is the structure where I have applied a positive bias. So, the system is in depletion, right? charges have moved back, I have a depletion. Phi sub s is the degree of band bending in near the surface compared to the bulk. That is how much the curve has been turned down compared to infinity. So, look at the curve on E i, E sub i. E sub i was in one value. If I did not put a voltage, then it would have been a horizontal line. After I have applied a voltage, it has bent a certain amount that is called a surface potential or surface band bending. I want to know how much that is that in next four slides. So, first of all, I can take that one and copy that one here. That is my V, minus V really, right? Because that was EC, so that is minus minus V. How do I get the electric field? I take a derivative of this, I get an electric field. And I take a one more derivative, I get the charge. What is this charge? This was that red charge. This is the depleted charge, right? So, I, I know this. Now, what will be the, my total gate potential? Gate potential is whatever oxide voltage drop that has occurred multiplied by how much surface band bending I have. Now, I obviously know Vg because I have applied it with my voltage source. So, I know 1 volt, 1.5 volts I know. I do not know Vox and I also do not know phi sub s. Somehow I have to find them, then my problem is solved. So, let us do that. Let us see whether we can do that. It is very easy actually. Do you see looking at the electric field curve that the electric field close to the surface, close to the surface is simply given by Q n a multiplied by W which is the charge from the bottom, right? This is a constant depleted charge depletion approximation divided by that uh, kappa multiplied by epsilon naught. That gives me the electric field at 0 plus, meaning inside the semiconductor. That, that, that is my electric field. If I know the electric field, can I compute the potential? Of course, because potential is essentially area under this blue triangle, the electric field triangle, right? Total potential. And so, what is that? I have a half for the triangle on the top. I have the electric field E sub z E at 0 plus and then I have W. W is the base of the triangle. So, you can see phi sub s, although I do not know what it is yet, this is related to the doping. It should. Somehow, if I could calculate the W in the magenta, if I calculate that, I would get phi sub s. Okay, not yet, but let us continue. Now, I can say that somehow if I can calculate, that is what I am saying, calculate W or calculate phi sub s, either one of them, then my other problem will be solved. But I have not done that yet. So, let us do it now this particular way. Pay attention to this equation because this equation you will see in various forms many times. Vg, that is fine. You see the second term on the right is phi sub s, the one that I just derived. W squared, you can see that business. Now, the Vg, uh, V ox, the oxide voltage drop, do you agree with the fact that E ox 0 minus X naught? X naught is oxide thickness, constant electric field, right? In that oxide region, no charge, so I have a constant electric field. Why have I said E ox 0 minus? Because the oxide starts with 0 minus, not the 0 plus. And here it matters because remember the dielectric constant of the oxide is different from the 
dielectric constant from the semiconductor. Do you remember this? Heterojunctions, two sides, different dielectric constants, the same thing over here again. Okay. Now you can easily then calculate E ox at 0 minus from E semiconductor at 0 plus just by dividing and multiplying with the relative dielectric constant. So that's what you have because I know E at 0 plus, right, in the last slide. What is unknown here? Only unknown here is W. Vg I know, I applied the voltage. You see, do you see everything else is a constant? If I know the doping and other things, I am set. In fact, I could have, so problem is solved, I am actually done. In fact, I could have also written it in a slightly different form because W is related to phi sub s, right? I told you in 5 seconds ago, in the last slide, that phi sub s is proportional to W squared. So from here, you can always relate W to phi sub s and you have the first W, first blue W in the term on the top. So you have a square root of phi sub s and anywhere you have a W squared, you have a phi sub s. What is this? This is a Vg equals some B square root of phi sub s plus phi sub s. S stands for surface, surface potential, that's why it's there. Now, have I solved the problem completely? Do you see? This is a quadratic equation because if I say square root of phi sub is x, then you can say x squared plus ax equals b and I know vg, I know b, it's a bunch of constants, I know them and therefore actually I have just calculated phi sub s, therefore I have calculated w and my electrostatic problem in depletion is solved. This is why in this region on the blue, this early part, this early part goes as square root of phi sub s, the blue part. This is the depletion part. Right? So this is what we have just done, just one piece. We have to do three pieces. I have just done one piece that explain why it goes as a square root of phi sub s. If you wanted to know how much depletion charge you have, you know, you could calculate that easily because it's Q N A W and W I know now, right? I just calculated W. So, therefore, it's related to phi sub s and if I solve the previous equation, then I will get the square root of phi sub s and that will be my charge density. So, the depletion region as you apply more and more bias, this depletion region expands and it expands as square root of phi sub s. Where have you seen this before? Do you remember in a PN junction, when you apply, when you apply a reverse bias in a PN junction, then the W expands and that was QVBI, VBI minus V, that was had the same dependence, the same physics of course. So of course you will have the very similar, similar dependence in the depletion of course, right? So, I will just introduce you to a uh, understanding of this where the other things would come from, but take it up, take this topic up in the next lecture properly. So, I have just explained to you where the square root of phi sub s dependence comes in. Look at the y axis, we are talking about amount of charge, amount of charge in that inversion region or in the depletion region uh, and then that is what we have just done. In the next class, what I am going to tell you is how to think about uh, in the inversion region, how to calculate the green charge, amount of green charge. Now, unfortunately, this I cannot do with depletion approximation anymore, right? This is not depleted. A huge amount of green electrons, mobile electrons moving around. So, this is no longer, uh, this is no longer depleted and this is something. I will do in the next class, do, do this calculation and correspondingly you see those holes generated in the accumulation, again it is no longer depletion, these are mobile charges. So I will have to do something extra to get back those holes and these extra electrons. Now why is it in a PN junction, we did not have to worry about these green electrons or the magenta elect uh, holes over there, why is it? We did not discuss this, right? We just did depletion approximation all the way, solved all the problems and everything. The reason is that I have an oxide. 
So when I put a lot of voltage, electrons can pile up next to it. If I didn't have that barrier, they would all go down. There's nothing to stop them. They could simply go flow out through the electron and hole current. They would flow it out. Here, because it's like a dam, I have a dam here flow, getting the outflow of electrons, stopping the outflow of electron. So the situation here is different. I don't have a current, but I have the effect of a current, which is building up these charges, something I do not have in the normal PN junction. So let me conclude. So as I said, MOSFET is a very important electronic device, but this is not a very good device in many sense in terms of performance. Why not do you realize? Because in a bipolar transistor current flow is vertical. So I have a lot of area through which current can flow vertically down. For a MOSFET, the current flow is lateral and then, then there is a thin sliver of region, that's the green electrons that you saw, that flows close to the surface. If you looked at the effective cross section of the region in which the electrons are going, well, most, you have a width, no problem, right, width of the transistors, the electrons are going. But in terms of depth in, into the device, that's the width of the green region maybe 100 angstrom, maybe 200 angstrom. So the effective cross section over which the electron flows is tiny. As a result, MOSFET has a very small amount of current. If you want a lot of current in MOSFET, you have to make it very wide. That was not the case for bipolar. And so intrinsically, this is a worse device. The only reason even a worse device sometimes wins up, you know, the slow and steady business that although it is a worse device compared to bipolar, but it has something very important advantage, that when you turn this transistor off, because of this insulator, there is no flow, no flow of current. In a, MOS, in a bipolar, you can never stop current, right? It's always the base current flowing in, always the base current flowing in. But here, you can completely stop the current. As a result, this is much more power efficient, and therefore, you can cram more of them into the same IC. Now this is a two-dimensional device as I told you about and so therefore we are looking into vertical side now and three class down we will talk about the lateral electron flow in response to this but this capacitors we are starting because we want to look at the vertical structure and this is very important that what we are trying to get is how much charges do you get for a given gate voltage. And that's different in different regions. Uh, so today we just got started. Okay, thank you very much.